Gaius and Lucius, the two grandsons of Augustus, were about the same age as Philo Judaeus, but not of the same turn of mind. They were far more eager to ride horseback or play games than to study Greek philosophy, especially as they were still struggling with the language. When the boys discovered a book written in Latin that explained what their tutor, a Greek slave, expected them to know, naturally they pounced upon it. Even though its author, Cicero, had been beheaded, they knew, as an enemy of their grandfather. Hide it, whispered one of them, as Augustus suddenly came upon them reading it one afternoon. But too late. Their grandfather took it, and the boys watched him in frozen silence. He slowly unrolled the book, reading here and there. Then he handed it back. The man who wrote this book was a great orator, said Augustus simply, and one who loved his country well. He stood there for a few moments with an odd expression on his face before he came back to the present and told the boys briskly that it would soon be time for dinner. They were to sit on the foot of his couch as usual. Then they might go for a drive along the sacred way or over to the Esquiline. These two boys, these sons of his daughter, Joya, appeared each day more dear and flawless in the eyes of their doting grandfather. To him they were the perfect combination of the gaiety of their mother and the strength of their father, his old and loyal friend Agrippa, whose loss he had never ceased to feel. Now, in 7 BC, Agrippa had been dead five years. Thirty-seven years had passed since that day in Apollonia when they had first visited the old astrologer. Messinus, too, was dead, Augustus's most trusted adviser. He had been gone a year. To fill his place, the now aging emperor had turned to his level-headed stepson, Tiberius. He had given Tiberius a position of power and importance in the state and had already come to depend upon his sound judgment and advice. It was not this stepson Tiberius, however, but those two young boys, offspring of his own flesh and blood, whom Augustus looked upon as the future heirs to his power as emperor. Of this Tiberius was well aware, but it troubled him far less than it did his ambitious mother, Livia. She watched with increasing annoyance the preference shown by her husband for those two grandsons. The chief source of annoyance to Tiberius was not the boys, but their mother, Joya, his wife, whom he had been forced to marry and whose scandalous conduct was now the common talk of Rome and had reached almost every ear but that of her adoring father. Tiberius had now purchased the beautiful estate of Messinus on the Esquiline, but he took no pleasure in living there with Julia. The gardens and villas were always filled with her fast friends, a dissolute, noisy crowd of ne'er-do-wells who drank too much, laughed too loud, and idolized to excess a clever but degenerate poet by the name of Ovid. Tiberius had been wondering for months how much longer he would be able to endure the loathsome position he was in. Though disgraced by a wife who bestowed her favors upon so many men they could scarcely be counted, he still could not stoop to tell her father the truth about her. Yet, if he did not tell, he must continue to live with her, if he lived in Rome. The only solution, as far as Tiberius could see, was to leave Rome, to retire from public office. The island of Rhodes had always appealed to him as an interesting place to live. Rhodes was a center for teachers and scholars of both East and West. There he could read, study, and live the quiet kind of life that he enjoyed. Livia begged him not to go. He was all she had now, her only son. Drusus had been killed two years before in Germany. Augustus was astounded at the proposition. Leave Rome? 
Why, pray Dale, for what reason? Retire from public office? Desert him, Augustus, now when he most needed his help? No, flatly no, he would not grant Tiberius permission. Tiberius closed his mouth, but firmly. He had made up his mind, and he was not to change it. For four days he shut himself in and went without food until permission was grudgingly granted. Then, quietly and quickly as possible, he prepared to leave. So secretly did he make his plans that almost no one in Rome knew that Tiberius had gone, until the ship on which he sailed was well down the coast of Italy on the way to Rhodes. Augustus was very bitter about what he termed Tiberius's unreasonable desertion of wife and family. Livia could scarcely hold her tongue. She longed to open the eyes of Augustus then and there to the sins of his daughter, but decided it was wiser to wait until she had an outstanding piece of scandal that was undeniable. So she bided her time, though impatiently. Tiberius found life in Rhodes suited him perfectly. He was away from Rome, but still in touch with the world. Almost all of the Roman officials in the east stopped there on their way back and forth. Ships from Alexandria often put in at the port made famous still by the remains of a once gigantic statue known as the Colossus of Rhodes, in one of the world's seven wonders. Study of the stars was one of Tiberius's main interest, astrology as well as astronomy, for the two had not yet been divided. In 6 BC, the first year Tiberius spent in Rhodes, almost everyone must have been scanning the skies, exclaiming and pointing to what looked to them like an extremely bright star, but which astronomers recognized as three planets close together. It was a very rare occurrence. Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars were all shining together in that station of the zodiac known as the fish. This was most remarkable, for the three planets travel at such different rates of speed that it is but once in a hundred years that they happen to come close together. And it is only once in eight hundred years that the three are all seen in front of that particular star pattern known as Pisces, or the fish. In 800 A.D., Europe was to be in the Dark Ages, so its appearance was not recorded. In 1604, it was reported again by an astronomer. In the year 2408, we are told, it is due to happen again. Probably no one in that year 6 B.C. who saw the strange and beautiful star ever quite forgot it. Some think it may have been the one mentioned in the story of the three wise men, or magi from the east, who followed a star to Jerusalem and then on to Bethlehem. For Herod, the king whom they visited in the story, was still alive. In this year, 6 BC, when Tiberius went to Rhodes, Herod, the king of Judea, had only two more years to live.